Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious today with Mr. Bob Castro. How you doing, Bob? I'm doing well after I finally got some sleep after being up all night. <laughs> We've all been sleep deprived on the Space Coast and that's a good thing. Behind us we have our heroes of Apollo 1 uh, in this beautiful uh, 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 drawing by new friend, Mr. Doug Forrest, who we met today at the American Space Museum. There's the entire uh, visual of his tribute to the Apollo 1. And Bob Castro is on the board of directors of the Apollo 1 Foundation. We're going to talk about that with him here towards the end. We've got a happy birthday to do there. Marty Winkle, my co-producer there, reminded me of that. Hey, Marty, how you doing? And we're going to work on getting Marty a microphone. In fact, our wonderful director, Karen Conklin, has okayed the purchase order of that, Marty. So we'll get you on air because Marty and I like talking back and forth. We know that's a good part of Stay Curious because Marty is a living legend in our minds working on the Apollo Lunar Module for Grumman. And you've done some documentaries about that, I'm sure. But uh, Bob, uh, tell everybody a little bit about what you do for a living and how you got to know the American Space Museum. Uh, well, I work in television post-production. Um, we work uh, to help to uh, preserve chemical motion picture films, uh, the films that uh, some of us grew up with that uh, had to be uh, shot and then had to be taken to a laboratory to be processed. Um, so we do commercial films, scientific and engineering films, government films, and even some people's private uh, home movie collections. And this is, where Where do you do this at? Where do you live? Uh, Atlanta, Georgia, mm -hmm. um, just outside uh, of Atlanta, Marietta, Georgia. Uh, the company is called CinePost, C-I-N-E-P-O-S-T, and the website is www.posthouse.com. Posthouse.com. That's right. And so uh, videotape cartridges, audio reel-to-reel uh, -reel or cartridge, uh, tape cartridges and uh, motion picture films of all kinds from Super 8 to 35 millimeter. We use broadcast equipment so we use the same techniques and gear so uh, it's uh, the, the very highest quality. In fact some of our clients do use it for documentary and broadcast applications and uh, all of us there are experienced with this having uh, worked in the days when TV stations had film departments. Uh -huh. Film at 11. Yeah, film, film at 11. At that, that. So we, we grew up with it all, and we know how, uh, how it works. I would advise that uh, people who have home movie collections, or maybe their parents did, and they're kind of hemming and hawing about whether they should get it transferred or maybe wait until Christmas, whatever, don't wait because the equipment's no longer made and there are no more spare parts being made. So when they wear out because it's a mechanical process, that's going to make it tougher and tougher to get it transferred. Plus, all of us who work on the equipment and the techniques, we're not spring chickens anymore. <laughs> right. And that information isn't being passed on. So so hurry up and get it transferred. It's kind of like the lack of, uh, uh, Marty will relate to this, the lack of citrus growers here on Merritt Island are all gone because the, the families, uh, the kids didn't want to take it over. It's hard work and they got better jobs and so forth down there. So... Uh, we've got a photographer in here. Roger, glad that you're here. If you could silence that beep, it's driving me crazy, buddy, on your camera there. Uh, uh, throwing my timing off a little bit. But thank you, sir. We're glad that you're here. Good friend of Bob's there. Roger's doing, done, you photographed stuff from the Gemini days probably, did you? Thor went to the Pentagon. Yeah, well, we'll have to get you on Stay Curious here one day, buddy. But thank you for silencing that. Uh, but we're going to... Uh, yeah, tell us how you got involved with the American Space Museum, Bob Castro. Yes. Well, uh, I was uh, a space kid growing up in the 60s. Uh, I remember the tail end of uh, Gemini and then, of course, Apollo and all those fascinating moon missions. And then uh, I, it was the best part about growing up at that time, the space toys. And, Absolutely. And Being and a baby boomer and living yeah. and, uh, what, what, what everyone's talking about 50 years later That's is... Right. Makes us feel old, but also makes us feel lucky that we were part of it. And then later as on, observers. Yeah, exactly. And then later on, when I got to meet some of the space veterans in college, like one of my professors had been an NBC radio reporter, and I would listen to their stories of behind the scenes of what it was like. I thought, naturally speaking, that the first moon landing would be the most memorable thing. But it wasn't. It was the Apollo 1 fire because it was such a shock. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a, a space mission, it was a test. And so uh, a, a space photographer named Bob Special, who took the last photos of Grissom, White, and Chappie getting into their spacecraft, uh, motivated me to contact NASA for the, on the 25th anniversary and visit the um, 
Launch Complex 34, which is on the base. It wasn't really publicly available. That's why I had to get permission. So I met the deputy base commander at the time, Johnny Johnson. Yeah. And he's just a real living legend. And we'll he, see a picture of Johnny here. Exactly. He introduced me to Mark Pinchel, a, a private citizen who'd been doing the same thing, just coming out there to pay his respects. And we kept growing, uh, kept, we hit it off. We kept coming back year after year. Every January 27th, the ceremony got bigger until in 97 for the 30th anniversary that we had a big public ceremony at the Space Mirror. And I was the MC and the organizer, and we had 50 members of all three uh, families, Grissom, White, and Chaffee. And I, I got to call in a flyover of jets. It's never happened before, and it'll mm. never happen again. Wow. So because Johnny was a volunteer nice. here, it was called the Spacewalk of Fame at that time, is how I got introduced to the fine folks yep. here. And I've been uh, back as much as my schedule will allow ever since. You've helped us transfer some film mm -hmm. uh, out of our archives. Mm -hmm. I've learned that some of this old film in a canister when you open up that canister you don't want to smell vinegar right yeah, you, that yeah. vinegar smell is so strong where the acetate uh emulsion have have just deteriorated it's called vinegar sy syndrome for a reason uh time is our adversary in a lot of areas and motion picture film if stored properly uh, can last for over 100 years and in fact uh, we have dealt with some 1915 1918 uh, nitrate film uh, at our company. But uh, if, if it starts to go bad, that can make it uh, dimensionally unstable, which makes it warped and, uh, and not light flat. So it's difficult to get an image off of it, but we know how to contend with that. Also, unfortunately, the chemistry can uh, change and alter the color balance. Instead of being the, the natural colors that were when it was shot, it can take on a, usually a reddish hue, mm -hmm. a pinkish one, and we have to use more and more extreme um, corrective software techniques to try to correct for that on a moment by moment and second by second basis. But we know how to do that and, and, and when I did retransfer the uh, museum's collection uh, in 2019, I had to use all the techniques in our toolbox to be able to restore it back to the way it would have been in the 1960s or 70s when it was originally shot. Mm. Well, uh... That, when we're appreciative of that too. He's done some of this uh, to help us with our collection, like he said, and uh, though we're not known for an archival type base there, the things that we do have here, uh, we want to, uh, uh, you know, make sure that we can have them for the future generation on there. Uh, I have left my notes over there. Uh, our, our, Marty, uh, hand me my phone over there a second, please. Yeah, thank you, Roger, there. Hey, Bruce. Hey. Bruce Jacobs is here, our IT guy. We're here with Bob Castro. Bob, talk a little bit about Bruce there. Well, I'm, uh, uh, your relationship with our IT guy here and how fabulous he is. Well, he doesn't have one of those uh, uh, tall cone-shaped uh, hats with the moon <laughs> and the stars on it, but he's the closest thing I've seen to an IT magician. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness, and he's wearing a wonderful shirt that says, See Doss, See Doss Run, Run Doss Run. And he for, is known for his T-shirts around here. And for computer users of a certain uh, uh, vintage, they will understand and get that joke. Uh, me, I, I uh, took computer courses in college in the late 70s and into the 80s, still on punch cards using Fortran and printing out the output on green bar paper. And again, that's the way computers used to be used. They were the size of rooms. And then they, because of the requirements of the space uh, program, they had to be shrunk in size so they could fit on board a spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So we owe NASA a lot uh, in terms of our technology and our, our way of life. Well, we owe Bruce a lot because he's our monster of social media as far as uh, the uh, Google uh, system of, of things going on. Uh, you know, we had over 100 adult guests in this building, 120 yesterday, which is a lot for our, I mean, that's the most in a long, long time. And uh, record sales in our merchandise department. And that's uh, because Bruce put it out there for all these people after the launch to see it there. So. Uh, we were very grateful to him. Bruce, we need to get you on Stay Curious here. I'll have to, I'll have to rope him in here one day because we talk about him a lot like we do all of our volunteers here. You've seen many organizations, all right? Uh, we've got four paid employees, a, a handful of volunteers. Uh, How does the outside world look at us through your eyes? Well, it, you can just tell the love, the love that you have for this endeavor, that this is something worth 
uh, documenting and something preserving uh, the efforts to explore outer space um, and because it was worth uh, taking the risks and overcoming the challenges to do it. It's one of the great stories of, of all time. And I'm really glad that motivated, skilled, dedicated, um, meticulous hmm. volunteers are, are willing to do that. Great stories of all time. Boy, you are a documentary maker. All right. <laughs> that sounds good to me, Marty. Yeah, the, the, the U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation was founded about 25 years ago for the monuments at Space View Park, the only place in the world you can put your hands on the handprints of Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan, Jim McDivitt, and any of your heroes out there, except our Apollo 1 heroes here. They passed away before that was done, and we have beautiful reliefs out there of them. Uh, and, uh, uh, but from the foundation and the Space View Park, people brought their stuff into the humble office and said, my dad passed away, he worked at NASA, here's his stuff. Right. And, and it still comes in the door, Bob. You can't believe what our intake is uh, every week uh, that keeps uh, Nick Enix, our collection manager, mm -hmm. busy and uh, challenges us to what to do with it when we don't have multiples of it or, and put it in the collection or save it for the collection. Uh, we sell it to the space lovers out there or some of that stuff is consigned where you can get a hold of us and, and we can consign your uh, items and, and, and sell them. So, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, I've just been here five years and left 35 years of friends and family in East Tennessee for this museum mm -hmm. in a positive way, because I knew that a uh, person like with my talents could be done out there. So, uh, uh, good. Someone said, quit hitting the table. Okay, Marty. <laughs> Uh, he's got the headphones on. It must be bothering him. Well, with my little my little computer in my hand here, he says bothering everybody. Okay, well, I'm a little keyed up today, and like I said, a little bit sleep deprived uh, with the launch. We'll know at 6 o'clock today at the press conference if things are going to go for Friday, or will it be maybe an October launch. But we want to honor always our astronauts, that, mm -hmm. uh, particularly our shuttle astronauts, because they're in communities doing great things all the time. Uh, do, do any Atlanta astronauts pop into mind that are in your community a lot? I'm trying to think of who's born in Atlanta or comes back uh, to Atlanta. Let's see. Um, ooh, his name. For us, it's Winston Scott and right. Mike McCulley live around here. And... Uh, let's see. There is one in, I know that John Young attended uh, Georgia, Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech, yeah. Georgia Tech, and there were some Rack. others. That's right. And... Um, as you as you speak, it'll probably occur. Yeah, to you speak it. Yeah, I just say, but uh, true, right? They're yeah. in all communities doing right. things visible out there. And happy birthday to this young lady, Megan MacArthur. I left my notes of Megan. I didn't print them out actually, but so I could. She was born August thirtieth, nineteen seventy one. That makes her fifty one years old. Her hometown is Honolulu, Hawaii. All right. She's married to Bob Bankin, who is a pilot of the first Crew Dragon demo. And then she was pilot of uh, Crew 2. How cool is that? You're sitting in the same seat your husband sat in. <laughs> That's right. In a private spacecraft. That has to be some good uh, dinner discussions between the two of them. Yeah. Uh, she's... Um, was uh, Expedition 65, uh, STS-125, all right. She was one of the backups of STS-400, which was the rescue mission. Mm -hmm. People don't know that about her. Uh, and uh, uh, so Megan, uh, it, well, here's her husband, Bob Bankin there, mm -hmm. run into Doug Hurley over the weekend at mm -hmm. Zarella's. Okay, that was cool. Uh, and uh, then here she is. Uh, uh, a year or two ago, and she's an active astronaut. She's not classified as an Artemis astronaut, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if she would qualify to be a commander of the Gateway Orbit in the Moon or whatnot as a non-Artemis astronaut, but there's 18 Artemis astronauts, nine women and nine men. Isn't that a great problem that. to have? It's like there's so many. There's the International Space Station. There's the Artemis missions to the moon. There's the, the Lunar Gateway that you actually have to sit there and divide out which part of your astronaut core yeah. is going to go where. Right. That's a great problem. And, and, and yeah, it's, uh, we hope that it continues that way. And there's plenty for everybody uh, in our astronaut core. 
Happy birthday to her. We had these visitors today. All right. Uh, on the left is uh, Daniel de Jong. He is an airline pilot, married to a Ukrainian lady. He's got a beautiful Ukrainian shirt on there, supporting uh, their hardships and, and battle, as it will, with Russia. And uh, that is uh, Doug Forrest in the middle. All right. And uh, uh, Hayesha, uh, uh, I forgot, right, got to write down his na his wife's names, uh, Harishiko. I'm sorry if I butchered that for you, but Mrs. Uh, Forrest there. Doug is responsible for this beautiful mural that we shared behind you that I just saw hours ago. And then uh, I threw it in there in our slideshow because we're going to be talking about Bob Castro and his affiliation with the Apollo One Foundation. So thank you, Doug. Nice to meet you. And Daniel also here uh, in our in our museum. So uh, we have got a couple launches. Bob, you know we celebrate space shuttle history like no other. Nine space shuttles launched in the month of August. The last two, 41D in 1984 on August 30th, and STS-8. This is STS-8 in 1983. All right, uh, on the 30th, uh, and. Um, both these missions had a total of nine astronauts, and the only experienced guys were the commanders. All right. So here you have nine astronauts going up to space. Each one of them, one had five, the other had uh, uh, four, uh, six, and uh, they had 11 astronauts total, six and five. All right. This had five on board. And all of them are rookies except for the commander. I wonder when that's happened the last time. But this is... Tom Usiak's beautiful night launch photography there, which Tom's uh, looking in here today. We had him and his brother on the uh, last week. Uh, Tom, quite challenging your night launches with the unknowns, the eighth shuttle launch, the first night launch. Uh, yeah, were you guessing at what F stops and so forth to use? Use daylight plus one to stop open. Okay, so so they, they had a formula, and this is with a beautiful Hasselblad camera that go see uh, us talk about those Hasselblad cameras. Uh, when was that, last Friday we did that? or la Yeah, last, last Friday, Friday we did that. So check that out on our YouTube or Facebook library there. But uh, this is a picture Tom Usiak took. Mm -hmm. What an awesome photo Looks of Guy Bluford there. Mm -hmm. He looks like he's ready to go, man. He's looking in Tom's camera and saying, I'm ready to go to space right there. All right. And we have there with him, as I consult my shuttle scroll here that I have data on, that's uh, uh, Dale Gardner there to the right, and Richard Truly's the commander right there behind Guy. And looking up, who knows what he's looking up, uh, at his Brandenstein there, the, the pilot. And uh, uh, Bill Thornton was the other uh, rookie on this flight. Excellent shot, Tom. That's an unusual angle of the walkout. Probably the last time they let him stand there. Well, that was because it was pouring rain. Oh, yeah. pouring and rain, but that's why brandenstein has got his hand out there looking in there. Right. So uh, uh, pouring rain a couple hours before the first night launch. And uh, it seems like that's about nine at night. wasn't wasn't in the middle of the night, but something yeah. like that. Great shot there. We want to talk a moment about uh, Guy and Bluford, the first African American to go to space. Seventeen others had followed him. Nineteen, if you count the two suborbital African Americans, and one is Michael Strahan. The I think of as a football player, but. Uh, everybody under 40 knows those. What, what is he on? Good, Good Morning America or uh, on there. Great guy. I'd love to meet Michael Strahan, seems to. Uh, but uh, Guy Bluford was born in Philadelphia. He had four missions, all right? This is one of his last missions because he's kind of gray there. And uh, here's another uh, retired picture of him. His last flight, Bob Castro, was 1992. Wow. Uh, and on STS-53. Uh, so he's he's looking at 30 years ago is when he flew to space. Um, you said you didn't have any direct dealings with Guy Bluford, except uh, tell us what, what you did do. Uh, we, did, we got some uh, film. It was in the collection and uh, of the Apollo 1 Memorial Foundation, which we also uh, transferred. 
and it was a, a biographical piece on him that was very well produced. There was a lot of resources that went into it to give the proper context for his uh, contribution to the space program. Um, and that was done in the, um, I would say, late 70s, I, I think it was, the, the, the time period when, when he had been selected. I'm sure you can look up that, that time period. But it had uh, uh, faded to red pretty drastically. So we had to employ some extra techniques. That's one of the nice things is that we have uh, personnel and resources that uh, if a standard uh, technique doesn't work, we can actually make our own. And so we had to do that in this case, and we got it uh, looking pretty darn good. It's pretty pretty watchable and is now in that archives and is either available for uh, researchers, perhaps even documentarians. Um, and, of course, uh, they, they have the option of perhaps uh, making that available publicly via streaming. Um, but I was very surprised that as an Air Force officer, they showed him in a wind tunnel. They showed him with one of uh, the designs that either he was involved in doing spin tests, vertical spin tests. It was a vertical uh, wind tunnel. And so my respect for him uh, was uh, even greater than before. Well, Guy Bluford, the first African-American in space, he is uh, born in 42, Marty. That makes him 80 years old this November. He's 79. And uh, catching up with you, Marty, there. Or, he passed or, me. Yeah, he's passed you. That's right. <laughs> he's uh, a Nittany Lion from uh, uh, the... Uh, 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 Pennsylvania, from Pennsylvania State University, Penn State, okay. And there, like I said, almost 30 days in space. People forget he had four flights, three after this. And uh, uh, and uh, he's a colonel in the Air Force. And and uh, we'd love for you, Nick Thomas, to introduce him out there at our astronaut encounter someday. So let's get uh, Bruce Melnick on that out there because he would pack the house. That's for darn sure. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a guy on his day in space, on this date in space history in 1983, 39 years ago. And uh, we had another launch today. This is another UCAC photo bouncing off the pad there. His discovery on his maiden flight on August 30th, uh, 1984. And uh, they had a launch abort in June on this that uh, we're going to put some pictures on Facebook that Tom uh, UCAC shot of that launch abort, which uh, we had uh, uh, one of the guys of 41 is Charlie Walker, celebrated Charlie's birthday yesterday. Hope you had a good one, Charlie Walker. He was in our museum not too long ago. And he said that launch abort in June before this August was a, a big pucker factor, is how he put it, for all the astronauts on board there. Uh, but we love talking about space history. And I, I do remember that, that launch board. I was, wa I was working for public television at the time, and we had a big 30-foot satellite dish uh -huh. so, in the days because uh, we uh, were a PBS affiliate. So I, I tuned to the NASA TV channel and was listening. This is the one without commentary. This is just the direct uh, mission control. And when uh, they said the word abort, I sat bolt upright in my seat because that's not a word that they throw around casually no and and as i recall they aborted to orbit to a safe uh, orbit but it was lower than planned but you're right about the the pucker factor yeah marty a comment yeah i said uh, mark took the abort shot oh mark took the mark all right little brother took the abort shots that we're not showing here but good we'll uh give credit where credit's due we got uh these paparazzis they they keep things right Accurate. We appreciate that out there. Uh, but, uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the buzz of, of yesterday's uh, 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 scrubbed uh, shot there. There you are. Picture I took you out there after <laughs> dawn broke out there. And uh, you were pretty uh, jazzed up about it. And, and re tell us your story about that. Well, uh, I um, never got to see a Saturn V launch in person. My mom didn't like crowds. So the, they said the understandable thing. We were growing up in Miami. Now, we got to say your mom didn't like crowds. We were teenagers. So mom was going to have to drive you there, right? <laughs> That's right. I mean, well, yeah, actually, yeah. I was eight years old, so it would have to oh, be really? the oh, whole okay. family. Oh, really? Yeah, mom was going to really yeah, have, have to drive have you to, there. Yes. But, um, I was 15. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, they said the understandable thing. So just watch it on TV. You don't have to actually be there, and there's crowds, and you don't know if it's going to go or not. And that's true, and yet it's not true. Because having been there from Sunday into, you know, Monday, essentially 24 hours, I will say that the excitement that was generated by the presence of all these people 
who um, it were, some of them were old enough to have seen launches, but a lot of young people and a lot of uh, international journalists were there. Oh. I was next to a crew from uh, German television. They interviewed me. I think they interviewed you, too. Um, They've interviewed Marty. They've interviewed lots yeah. of us. Uh, so it, yeah. it would be the equivalent in a different cultural sphere of saying, well, you didn't have to go to Woodstock. You just buy the records and you can hear the music. It's like, right. no, you don't get it. It was being there at the time and having the magic of that because across the water on Complex 39B, through binoculars, or I had a, a one-meter telescope hooked up to my video camera. I was ready to shoot with that. It's like you're looking and saying, that is an office building-sized ship that's going to rise off the earth on pillars of fire and is going to leave at a speed much faster than a rifle bullet. And several days from now, it's going to arrive at the moon. And if that does not stir something within you, then... Uh, God bless you, but <laughs> it certainly stirred something within me. Well, biblical is how you described it there. That, that's very nice. And yeah, you know, even though it was a, a, a scrub, Marty, we had a good time. Everyone mm -hmm. was, was, was really, there was a couple thousand people here in this area. There. there you see the Max Brewer Bridge. People are standing on that. That's the gate. That's the, the bridge that goes into the Maritime Wildlife Refuge. Uh, uh, you know, too bad. I think people generally, I didn't hear an angst of disappointment because they enjoyed the circus, not such circus going on, but, and everybody had to get up at two, three in the morning to get there. And at five, six in the morning, a bunch of us are used to getting up at eight, you know, or seven. It was sort of like kind of quiet, you know. Yeah. I bet they could, I, if I'd had a, if I had the smarts, I'd had a coffee uh, machine there, uh, cranking out coffee for everybody. But, mm -hmm. Uh, we'll find out this afternoon uh, what's going to happen uh, with their uh, decision to uh, scrub and when they can launch again. It was an anomaly, as they described it, quote, the conditioning of the SSME engines. Mm -hmm. You know, Marty's work was a uh, manager in the space launching system, launch pro space launch process system for 30 years. He's never heard it referred to like that. Uh, as a conditioning of the the engine, which was they were putting that cool hydrogen through it, it has to spin through, and and make it so it would work on there. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the uh, the terminology's even changed. Though the the hardware stays the same on there. So the important thing is, is to put the context is even though technically it was uh, it was a, a launch scrub, and so technically you could say we it, it was a less than um, a desirable outcome. Even though the rocket didn't go, a lot of friendships did. I made several friends. There was a wonderful couple from Massachusetts. I mean, I just came from Atlanta. I yeah. Nothing like coming from, you know, the Bay Area, you know, Boston, um, who were there, and they were all excited about it. Uh, there was another uh, a couple of friends uh, who came down from Kentucky uh, for it. And as I said, all these international visitors. But here's the thing. If you had taken with a very massive telephoto lens that Max Brewer Bridge close-up, you would have seen it was covered in people. Yeah. So these were people who didn't have to, they could have watched this on television, but what they wanted was, I think, what the same thing 50 years ago with the crowds who came to see moon, watches, uh, moon launches or ones on television. They wanted something positive. They, uh, with, because of the turmoil and the angst and the bad news that was occurring back in the 60s mm -hmm. and in some ways today, People gathered together from all these different geographic regions, all these different cultural backgrounds to share in something that was positive, was good and decent, and it had the uh, potential and will eventually uh, to have great scientific and educational, maybe even industrial uh, uh, payback. But the point is, it, was, we could, it shows what we can do when we're cooperative, and we're all working together toward a noble goal. Uh, as opposed to just sitting there being in conflict and being angry about who said what on social media. Well, well said, Bob Castro. Marty, would you circle our rocket hobo? Uh, uh, Ozzy Osbourne's in there. Ah, okay. Uh, and the uh, uh, brunette to the left there is, is Patricia. Uh, and Patricia's a, 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 I've gotten to meet her. A friend, I've made friends with Patricia. There's Ozzy there. Mm -hmm. Uh, the black-haired lady on the left is Patricia. She's a, a solar system ambassador. And we'll put, uh, because I made a lot of good friends. And then they came into our museum. And uh, I, I'm telling you, we 
we have made an impact mm -hmm. here at the American Space Museum uh, as far as, as people wanting to see our artifacts. And then we hope more people want to follow us on Stay Curious because we are a proud nonprofit and uh, we are monetizing our YouTube uh, uh, shows of Stay Curious. So the more people that watch them and watch those ads, the more uh, will help our museum financially. But we might make 20 cents off this show today, Bob, so don't get excited. I'm not going <laughs> to, yeah. I might buy you dinner, okay? There you go. But... <laughs> well, I'd like to, to shout out to Ozzy because what he did uh, on his own, I mean, he, this isn't required of him, is he provided an audio link. He had the equipment, he's a ham radio enthusiast as well, so that the people here who there are no official loudspeakers, he provided the, the coverage so that we could hear the commentary as it went throughout the night. He was there during the day as we were. He also provided what's called a power tap, which was very vitally important for the journalists. We had camera batteries that had to be charged and equipment, mm -hmm. and he would let us do. Now, he had, uh, you know, a little contributions uh, uh, jar, and so we, we gratefully put in money. But it's that kind of thing where someone sees a need and fills it and does it out of the goodness of their heart for positive reasons. So congratulations yeah, to He's Ozzie. 72 years old and on fixed income, so, you know, he makes that extra money. We were glad of that for him there. But uh, yeah, it's, it was a, a, and we hope to redo it again Friday. Uh, uh, it'll be a whole different atmosphere with an afternoon launch. Mm -hmm. You know, I guarantee yeah. you that. But uh, any final thoughts of uh, uh, Spaceview Park and, and the Artemis? Uh, you said you're going to have to go back to Atlanta. So, well, well whenever an American flagged uh, vessel uh, takes off for anywhere, but particularly for the moon, you know, you can be count on me just cheering it on. I know there's a lot of, um, uh, turmoil in its own right between having now a government program and uh, private uh, uh, rocket companies. But, you know, space is big enough for everybody. And there's there's enough uh, to do and enough uh, uh, room for uh, innovative designs that I, I think will we'll do okay. So I just say as long as somebody is trying to l launch to, uh, some payload or crew into space for good positive reasons, for peaceful reasons, I think we should all celebrate and we should all cheer for them. Hurrah! You got you got it there. Well, Bob Castro uh, is, a, uh, like I said, a great friend of the museum. He's one of the first people I met here at this museum, uh, coincidentally, back in the day. Uh, Gee, you know, about five years ago, you were getting the film from Bruce to do stuff on there. And uh, but uh, what is interesting that I've learned, as you have, is there are so many behind the scenes people whose names will yeah. never come to the surface. Uh, and Marty Winkle is one of them. All right. A humble guy that worked on Lunar Rover, or, I mean, Lunar Module. Uh, and we've met people along the line that, that are characters and some of them have passed on. And I want you to speak about that as we talk about uh, this guy uh, that uh, I found a picture mm -hmm. of you with Don Arabian. All right. His nickname was Mad Don Arabian. And uh, tell us a little bit about Don. He passed away about a year ago at age 92. Wow. But this guy was one of the most important brains in Johnson Space Center. Tell him why. Well, he was the uh, was a troubleshooter. Uh, it was called the Spacecraft Analysis uh, uh, Room or Department Span was the nickname. And these were folks who had to, they had to be able to diagnose and solve problems from as much as a quarter of a million miles away during these uh, Apollo missions. And uh, Mad Don Arabian, as uh, he was known, uh, was, was instrumental in that. And I literally read about him in that excellent book, uh, Apollo Race to the Moon by Charles Murray and Catherine Bly Cox. Uh, absolutely a classic um, uh, text on the, the subject. And he's mentioned in there along with people like Sam Bedingfield and John Tribe and uh, other luminaries. And uh, because of my involvement with the Apollo 1 Memorial Ceremony and uh, the museum, I've gotten to meet a lot of them. And, uh, and Don was one of them. And I, I actually interviewed him for my own documentary, which I'm doing on the original launch sites of the early space program. Uh, uh, Roland Miller is a space photographer who I met because of the Apollo 1 memorial ceremony and his beautiful interpretive uh, landscape type coffee book type uh, pictures are, have provided a, a lot of motivation to me. Don had to be able to um, separate, well he said that if you have uh, 20 data points and 19 of them line up but one does not, you can't make the leap 
to saying, yes, I understand what this problem is. You have to be able to understand all 20. And, and it, he was given the a particular imperative because human life was on the line. The astronauts' lives depended upon their ability to identify, isolate, and repair problems with the spacecraft while it was going on. So, of course, during the Apollo 13 mission, which had its troubles uh, you know, going to the moon and, and, and getting back, as well as the more um, um, missions that um, uh, went to script, um, they were always busy. They were always busy isolating uh, problems, looking at telemetry. And the interesting thing is that um, he says we didn't need any fancy consoles. Their room uh, was described as having a series of uh, church tables, like you, like a church would have in a basement. Uh, they had uh, senior members of all the contractors there. So if they needed to ask a question of Grumman or of North American or Lockheed or whoever it was, they had senior people there. They did have monitors on the uh, ceiling or on the wall near the ceiling and they'd have the binoculars looking at the same monitors that the crews in the mission control room the uh, mission operations control room were looking at but they were running them for interpretation in order to solve problems and yes they were quite successful so we uh, the the country um, the astronauts lives themselves we all owe a debt to Don Arabian and his colleagues in Span. So I would say look that up, and if you can, get a, a copy of the Murray and Cox book, Apollo Race to the Moon, you will not be disappointed. You hear, hear that, John Trod? Bob Castro thinks you're a luminary, all right? Yes. <laughs> there. And, and John Tribe's uh, doing well, and he's they're getting ready for the next rocket reunion in November, and uh, he's a great, great friend of our museum. We love John Tribe. Uh, and his wife also is a, a great space uh, worker. Uh, the uh, I want two quick stories about Don Arabian. Uh, one, he's a very boisterous guy. I liked him because he swore a lot. All right, which uh, he's sort of unpolitically correct in today's world, but back in the '60s, that's how he got the job done. Instead of using an intercom in his office, he'd scream down the hall at someone to come in his office, according to his obituary. And I got to meet him on several occasions, including this one. Uh, he was a lot of fun. Even he's a fun guy. Even in his, he lived to be 92, I think. He's about 88 here. Uh, but um, and he designed his own house. I got to interview him in his beautifully architectural. I wouldn't even know what to call it. It was a very kind of open uh, plan design. But oh, it was, really? It was his own design. Have you ever seen his notebooks and stuff? He was like a cartoonist. And he said, what's wrong with the shuttle program? He wrote this whole booklet. It's like a cartoon of things in there. But they had a problem with the Agena rocket that was going to, that the Gemini spacecraft was going to dock with. Okay, Gemini 8 was the first time they did that, 1966. And they were wondering, okay, we've got, the Agena rocket was going to motor, was going to be able to turn off and on and take the, the Gemini up to about 800 miles. And they needed the data of the fuel registrations and all this stuff on there. So they didn't know where to put the, the instrumentation for the Agena inside this cramped Gemini spacecraft. And Don, in an interview that we did with him uh, on film, uh, uh, said, hey, you're looking out the windows. Why don't you put it out there on the rocket? You're looking out those windows. Put it on the rocket out there. So they did. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. Brilliant decision there. Uh, he didn't say, hey, you, he had another other way of saying it, but he says, you got this, you're looking. At... Then the other thing Don Arabia is famous for, one of the last things he did, he told me, before he retired, was he engineered the parasol that saved the Skylab. Mm -hmm. The little umbrella chute that they stuck up there and, and, and to, to cool it down uh, when the, the second, the first crew went up there. And uh, I said, I said, boy, you were retiring and so forth, you know, did they... Did he give you a little extra for that? He says, I got a healthy bonus for that, he said. So, uh, you, as you know, quite a character. Uh, one of the true uh, geniuses of behind the scenes in the Apollo program, Mr. Don Arabia. And I know this guy, Johnny Johnson, in later years, photo there. Tell us about your good friend, Johnny. Oh, my goodness. Apart from my own father, Johnny Johnson was a real father figure. Not just to me, but to, as I understand it, pretty much everybody he met. Uh, I attended the Apollo 1 Memorial Foundation board meeting uh, at, at this morning, and we all looked around and said none of us would be here had it not been Johnny. Oh, he wow. introduced all of us to each other into the noble effort to remember the names so that as long as people remember anything, they'll remember the fact that we went to the moon. And of all the people who were uh, 
need to be remembered in history. The names Grissom, White, and Chaffee need to be on that list, if not leading the list. So Johnny was a great, uh, he was a deputy base commander of Cape Canaveral, it was called Air Force Station in those days. But even after his retirement, he still was very active in escorting uh, visitors out there of, of a press nature, uh, movies. If you see the movie Armageddon, uh, he actually appears in it because he was so instrumental in getting, oh, really? getting the movie crew uh, out on location. Onto the, you know, the space shuttle uh, was just a few days from launch, and they were actually shooting out there with a, a live space shuttle, which is not a trivial thing to do. Uh, but he was just a marvelous man and would just... It, particularly for young people, if anyone showed an interest in space uh, flight or doing anything noble, he was right there with encouragement and um, and just providing an example in a, term, a turmoil-filled world of what leading a good and decent life could be. And he's missed. We lost him a couple of years ago, I believe, and right. I never got to meet him, but he was well known to the... the, the uh founding fathers of our U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation, the American Space Museum. Um, you know, when we talk about these these uh, guys here, uh, let me get, uh, uh, I really am, it kind of upsets me when I see a beautiful poster of, of all of the mission patches or a mug or something that have got all of the Apollo missions on there. And oftentimes, Apollo 1's not on it. Uh, and they should start everything with the Apollo 1 patch and now that I mention it, you'll notice things that you have in your home that might celebrate uh, the Apollo program. And uh, the Apollo 1, it should start with the Apollo 1, not Apollo 7 on there. But uh, that's my editorial comment for the day because we're going to talk about one of the most amazing days of my life, thanks to Bob Castro. All right. Uh, I'll, and I'll, I'll set it up here with uh, the brother of Gus Grissom. Uh, is an outstanding human being. Tell us about Mr. Lowell Grissom. Well, uh, I was very surprised to learn that uh, Mr. Lowell worked uh, in the space program. He worked in the in the Atlas program. I believe it was in uh, not at the Cape area, but uh, closer to the to point of manufacture. Uh, but he too just uh, you could just tell that he was from the same stock. Uh, you can just kind of a reflection of what Gus would have been. And in fact, an interesting story is in uh, 1997 on the 30th anniversary, uh, when my fiance at the time, my, my wife was in the audience, and there were two guys that were in front of her, two old guys. And as Lowell was speaking, representing the Grissom family uh, there at the Space Mirror, one of the guys leans over and goes, you know, he looks and sounds just like Gus. Yeah, you know, if you kind of squint your eyes, you can imagine that he what does look like there. us. He, he does. In older, I mean, they're uh, good friend of our museum. He comes around for our astronaut memorial every uh, January, mm -hmm. the last Saturday of the month. It's going to be Sunday this year, the last Sunday of the month. I'll tell you more about that as we go along, because mm -hmm. the, the the Jewish consulate has asked that we do it on a Sunday so they can mm -hmm. honor Elon Ramon. Oh, okay. And uh, but he shows up at our American Space Museum. He's got a Gus Mobile sweatshirt on. This is this was January twenty seventh, uh, two thousand nineteen, I believe. That is Gus Grissom's flight suit. The picture of him wearing it with his two boys there. I had privilege to meet Scott. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and uh, just champions his his brother uh, in, a, in a very positive manner. Okay. And he also worked at McDonald's uh, as a PR person, basically. Okay. He was in public relations at McDonald that built the, the Gus Mobile. And it's called that. Why is it called the Gus Mobile? Well, as I understand it, Gus had a lot of input into its design and layout. Of course, he was a fighter pilot, as, as uh, all the Mercury astronauts were, uh, or uh, an accomplished uh, aviator. Um, and, and so, <laughs> as I understand it, uh, Tom Stafford would say, yeah, I can tell this was made by Gus because it's short like he is. <laughs> Tom was tall and it was kind of a, a little cramped, he felt, until he got up in weightlessness. But he had a lot to, to, if you think about it, Gus Grissom was the second Mercury astronaut to fly after Alan Shepard. And he uh, was instrumental in, in a lot of the pilot's uh, design uh, input for the uh, Gemini flight. He flew the first manned Gemini mission. He was assigned to be commander of the first Apollo mission. And so you can see the amount of uh, weight that they put on his opinion. I remember Wally Shira saying, Gus was a, uh, was a man of few words, but he was a superb engineer and you could hang your hat on anything that he said. 
And then uh, supposedly Deke Slayton said that had it not been for the fire, Gus would have been the first man on the moon. Uh, there's no question that he would have had the first shot to be uh, to have his team and choose who he wanted to go from Deke Slayton, who was the chief of the astronaut office with mm -hmm. Alan Shepard assigning those things on there. Uh, yeah, quite... Uh, uh, you know, quite stirring to hear this history from, from the, the, the mouths of the people there. Marty, we had a great uh, honor to interview uh, 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 Mr. Grissom Lowell there. That was March uh, 2020, I think, right before we, we closed of COVID, mm -hmm. a couple of months there. So there's our set there uh, uh, that we're, we set up in the Gemini Gallery. Now we're in our entire studio here. Uh, at the American Space Museum. But we look forward to uh, many more years of you coming around here, Mr. Lowell, and uh, I'll try to send this to him. Uh, he lives in uh, uh, he lives in St. Louis, but tell us where uh, they grew up and what goes on uh, in their childhood home. Well, uh, Mitchell, Indiana uh, is where they, they hailed from. And one time I asked uh, when uh, the older brother, Norm Grissom, was still uh, with us. And they were out at Complex 34 for the annual ceremony. I asked the two of them, I said, is there any stories you can tell on Gus, you know, growing up? Because his career as an astronaut is fairly well documented. But what about, you know, what was it like to grow up with Gus Grissom? And Lowell paused and said, well, one time that they were given the assignment by their parents of, of getting a cow. They had to get a cow from one place to another. And so they had some kind of uh, harness uh, uh, on the front, a bridle, and but the cow was not cooperating. And so uh, Norm and Lowell look at Gus, you know, to say, hey, can you help us out here? And, and it was like, ah, you, looks like you got this under control. I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, you don't need my help any. <laughs> but it showed how down to earth they were. Um, we understandably kind of elevate our astronauts to be uh, these, these figures put on a pedestal. But they were also ordinary people. You know, they had lives, they had families, they had ups and downs and everything of that nature. But it was just good mis Midwestern stock, if you will. A good, a good example of that is Sam Bedingfield, who passed away 10 years ago and helped find this museum as it was a real... Uh, public relations person in the end at NASA, the presidents and of countries and stuff were escorted around by Sam Bedingfield. Mm -hmm. He and Gus went to University of Purdue, to Purdue together. And after they graduated, Gus calls up Sam Bedingfield, who's working a tobacco field in North Carolina, and he doesn't like that work. And Gus says, well, why don't you come on down here to, to Florida and help us launch rockets? And Sam Bedingfield goes, well, I don't know anything about rockets. And famously, Gus Grissom said to Sam Bedingfield, don't worry, nobody does. You have to start and, somewhere. And, uh, you have to start somewhere is right. So uh, tell us a little bit. And again, we, we, we uh, 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 are honored to have Doug Forrest's rendition of them behind us here. Tell us a little bit about the Astronaut Memorial Foundation. Here is the ceremony that went on. I got to just set this up. You called me. Uh, in uh, January of 2021 during the pandemic and said, Mark, uh, would you like to go out to, for this ceremony? Mm -hmm. And it was January 27th, the exact day that they died at this exact spot with the moon rising. So tell us about why this is important and, and, and a little bit about the, the uh, Apollo 1 Foundation. Well, I imagine that Civil War soldiers, when they would talk about Gettysburg, would probably be able to call up the same kind of emotion that comes with either people in the space program because it, it was for me I was just you know a kid in Atlanta but I'd hear these space veterans a photographer Bob Special who took the last photo of Gus going in there um, uh, the, the, the NBC radio reporter talking about covering the story and it's like well I gotta go there and once you're there you just feel the ground resonate with the history you just realize that this was an amazing place that they were attempting to leave the earth and and go to the stars and as sad as it is to say they were actually successful this is where they left the earth for the last time mm -hmm. and so you cannot go out there and remain unchanged you leave uh, it duh, yeah it, it, it's one of the most uh, top five things in my life i'll never forget uh because uh as a teenager and the headlines over the news and so forth in finley ohio and then here uh uh 
50 some years later, I'm standing on the hollow ground. It's hollow ground. And yeah. I don't understand why NASA doesn't take people out there every day for free. But uh, uh, I already had one comment, editorial comment today. So I better not say that. But uh, very humble uh, uh, guess. Uh, who, who gets invited out there? Well, it's after uh, Mark, Mark Pinchel was kind of the founder of the ceremony. He was another private citizen with no official connection with the space program. And as I understand it, in uh, the mid 80s, he wrote for uh, permission to, to go visit the site and did. And at that time, he said that the, the substance of, this, of the memorial ceremony was him, a security card and a boom box. Uh, that he would leave some flowers and and say some uh, prayers and and that would be it. So in 1992, on the 25th anniversary, when my mom and I had driven down there, and uh, we were out there at at, at noon time uh, because it was NASA that was taking us around. Well, this Air Force truck drives by, and in it is Johnny Johnson, and he said in his own particular way, "I'm always curious who's nosing around my cape." <laughs> so I told him why I was there, and said, "Well, there's this young fella that comes out every year. You ought to stick around and meet him." So needless to say, Mark and I hit it off immediately, and we kept coming back year after year, and the ceremony kept growing. So um, in, in the 97 ceremony in, for the 30th anniversary, we had probably about 50 members of all three families. And they had been, it was the first time there was a public ceremony since their funerals is to recognize. Right? 30 to, years to recognize. To it. recognize it. Now, the thing is, the, we knew that the people in the program had not forgotten. Uh, but they had internalized it the way that they personally chose to do. Uh, but there was a whole generation or, you know, generation and a half that had grown up without knowing about their sacrifice. So that right there, that bronze plaque was paid for by Pinchel's family. That was not a NASA thing. And that's not a criticism of NASA. Their job is to be going and exploring. And paid for by whose family? Uh, Mark Pinchel's Mark family. Mark Pinchel. Okay. And, and that, that bronze plaque uh, cast and attached to the remains of the launch stand lists um, Grissom, White, and Chaffee uh, and what happened there and the date and the time so that all of us could remember. And it, it, each of us carries shards of history with us. We can't just say, look back and, and say, well, I'm going to sit back and let professional historians and professional archivists and big institutions keep history. All of us have these interesting little stories that we have that will be self-extinguishing if they're not written down or recorded or told to someone else. The stories will disappear when the people do. So it's really up to us without any sense of uh, resentment or rancor to say, look, I'm going to do my part to help remember history, whether it's at Pearl Harbor or Gettysburg or some other site. But uh, you coming out there helped me to see the event through your eyes as a new visitor. And we're, whenever people speak of brave men or great deeds, Grissom, White, and Chaffee, their names need to be remembered. And it, it shouldn't have been us. I mean, I was a kid. I was on the living room floor with my space toys, following along with the missions. It should have been Newton, Isaac Newton. It should have been Robert Goddard who developed the liquid fuel engine. It should have been Jules Verne or H.G. Wells to see us land on the moon. But it was me. So my responsibility is to enjoy and to mark the importance of that and then to tell others about what it's like when we actually choose to work together because we're... Uh, Differences are inevitable, but division is a choice. We can choose to be disunited or we can choose to be united for a common good purpose. And that's the example, the legacy, I think, that Apollo 1 leaves for us. Well put, Bob Castro. All that's left of the pad is this concrete structure that the uh, engines of the uh, Saturn S1B sat under the moon rising there. They did launch uh, the Apollo 7 from this very pad with the, uh, the, the uh, engine sticking out through that hole up there in the sky. And uh, it's, uh, we hope that you get the privilege to go out there if you're a space geek and, and, and honor this hollow ground out there. It's truly stirring to me and I'm, uh, I owe you a big one there for inviting me out there uh, because to be out there on the day, 54 years to the moment mm -hmm. that they died, uh, at like six o'clock on July, January twenty seventh, nineteen sixty seven, was quite quite stirring for me to to think about that. And Roland Miller, I think, put it best. He says, "You can go to a museum and you can see the spacecraft, but only the launch sites are in their original context. It's still the same distance to the ocean." 
the the uh, softness of the air, the things uh, about its environment are the way it was when it was active. And that's something that cannot be reproduced on film, no matter how good the film is shot, the, the quality of the light, the, the play of the land and the sea and the sky, that's where everything all comes together. And that's why these, these places need to be preserved, if possible, but because uh, time will eventually have the last word. But even if uh, it isn't preserved physically, people need to, uh, if possible, visit and to share their reactions to how this place changed them. Absolutely. We've enjoyed this conversation with Bob Castro, who is a wonderful filmmaker. Uh, you're, you're like a, a, a good photographer. You always have a, uh, I might say, motion picture camera, video camera at your yeah. beck and call there. Uh, to conclude here, tell us uh, about your, your meeting with the board of directors of the Apollo One Foundation. What are, what are they doing going forward in the, the 21st century here? Well, they had, uh, it was a very good meeting uh, this morning. Of course, some people had to join remotely uh, who weren't able to be uh, physically present. Um, but uh, we had two important votes on uh, some initiatives. Uh, I'll, I'll let the uh, the director, uh, I won't uh, uh, steal her thunder, uh, but it for, for students who express a sincere interest in studying uh, aviation, aerospace, uh, space and whatever, um, the the board approved uh, uh, additional scholarships, so there'll be more scholarships available uh, through um, the local institutions here in Florida to to further the the study of the heavens. And where does that funding come from, Bob? Um, it it comes from donations and from other fundraising activities. Um, there have been actually through the museum and through Chuck. Uh, has has helped uh, with uh, appraisal of certain our uh, auctions. Items. Yes, uh, Chuck exactly. Jeffrey, our, our uh, chief operating officer and collection analyst. Yeah. Yes. Well, good. And I'll let, I'll uh, get some information uh, from Bob Castor about that to post on our Facebook. So on there. But I'll end with this, Bob. Uh, uh, you know, it's a uh, to talk to one of the children of of these fallen people, and and I've gotten a, my a good fortune to meet uh, Roger Chappie's daughter mm -hmm. also. Uh, but uh, Scott uh, Grissom's carried the, the torch for his dad, just like his brother Lowell mm -hmm. on there. And uh, uh, when we ended our day there, okay, our evening at this ceremony, I'm, I'm walking away and I just had to take one last look at, at the massive structure there with the moon rising. And, and my gosh, there was the Grissom family Go ahead and hit that, Marty. Uh, the Grissom family uh, walking away uh, on the night that their dad died on there with the moon rising above that structure. And that shows you that their uh, life is um, life is important. It's important to to, uh, to preserve, protect, and defend. But it's also important to live it. And and those men lived it to the, the fullest and the best. And they, they did the hard work. They showed us the way forward. And we can choose to follow them. And, and that is a noble pursuit. And follow them we will. And you know it would be so appropriate for the first landing on the moon uh, since uh, uh, Apollo 17, which is planned to be Artemis 3, mm -hmm. if they would take something with them to the moon to remember uh, this, this tremendous crew of, of, of smart people. We've talked about Gus. Uh, Grissom, of course, Ed White, uh, one of the most outstanding astronauts in the Corps, personal friend of, of Neil Armstrong, uh, another tremendous loss. And Roger Chaffee was one of the whiz kids coming That's up. Right. And, and had they all three lived, they all three probably would have been moonwalkers at some point in time, That's don't true. you think? Yes, I, I've got one suggestion. If there's anybody from NASA listening, even when Artemis does finally fly, this unmanned test, even though this, this is un unmanned, the translunar injection burn, when in the Apollo days, Houston would radio up, Apollo, you are go for TLI, you are go for the moon. I mean, the hair on my neck would stand up. So, yeah. so here's the suggestion. Even though this is unmanned, when they get the uh, first Artemis uh, into orbit and you go for TLI, the Capcom should still key the mic and say, Artemis 1, you are go for TLI, you are go for the moon. Because even though the anthropomorphic dummies in the ship, you know, aren't in no care, we are, are uh, hope, I hope that kids are inspired to a fraction of the degree that we were 
when we hear that. Because the other thing that was memorable for me for, was not just Neil Armstrong's words standing on the moon, but when they first landed. Because remember that? And yeah. Charlie, Charlie Duke says, we copy you down, Eagle. Armstrong keys the mic and says, Houston, tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. And as a kid, I was like, we've got a base on the moon. That is fantastic. I hope they do that again, too. Yeah. We were hoping that base would stay on the moon, like an Antarctic base. <laughs> Give a shout out to some of our Stay Curious uh, watchers that before, have enjoyed your program today. Before you do that, I have to explain the TLI. Oh, Wait, explain that uh, uh, Marty says, uh oh, an acronym <laughs> TLI means a translunar injection burn. That is the parking orbit that the, uh, the spacecraft gets into once it's launched. And then after checking out after an orbit or two, uh, making sure that the, the ship is, is behaving the way it should, they approach, so they approach the departure corridor and they fire the uh, upper stage engine again to leave the Earth, leave the Earth's orbit and go on a translunar injection. And that TLI is a very important moment. Super. Get in your best voiceover nice. voice there. Uh, let's uh, say welcome to some of our listeners out there. Well, we have Cynthia Ross. Is that Ross? Rossi. Uh -huh. Rossi, Rossi. Gary Jarrell. Gerald. Gerald, okay. Dave Eight. Stangy. Stangy. You butcher that, Dave. So. <laughs> Melissa Pody. Pope. Pope. Oh, Pope. Uh, Adrienne Patrick. Good enough. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is that Carlton Car Bailey? Carlton he's Bailey. Okay. Buddy. Ah, yes, I've seen he's some of your work. Very, very, very good. Curious. Thank yeah. you, Tom uh, Celentano. 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 Yeah. Tom and Mark, you. UCAC. There's UCAC, there's which are there. Uh, yeah. William Whiting. Yes. Hi, okay. William. And Alex Carl. Alex Carl is our ESA or Eurocom that was watching our show yesterday. No. Oh. Uh, and and con he he messaged me. Alex said we're gonna do. A, it's been our show a couple times mm -hmm. here in our studio, and then we've done remote in Germany with yeah. him. Okay. And he was very. Uh, he liked the pictures we showed yesterday of the excitement because mm -hmm. he's involved with the ESA and everything with them, and they've got Samantha Christopheretti up there mm -hmm. and there, and Chris Callie. Thank you for watching, Chris. Uh, he's ripping his hair out here, looking at the Doug Forrest picture here behind him, <laughs> behind me here. No, he's not. He, they all know. They're all good buddies in there. But uh, uh, what a nice, nice program and nice tribute to these fallen heroes. Uh, Bob, thank you so much for all you do to support our museum. We've missed you for the last couple of years here. So I uh, hope that you put... Uh, uh, some quick vacations uh, from Atlanta here to the Space Coast in the future. Yeah. Anything you'd like to say in parting? No, just uh, delighted to be here. Pleasure as always. And thank you. Thank you for her helping to preserve our cultural history because it is worth preserving. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Marty, for a great Streamlabs job. Thank you, Jessica Galloway, for our late phone call here to put Bob's name up on the bottom here. <laughs> and... Uh, We've got another great week of some guests. Thursday, we're going to have uh, Delania Yancey here, a lovely young lady who works at the U.S. Space Rocket Center. Uh, she is uh, uh, an educator there in their space camp. Mm. And we're going to have her on Thursday. Tomorrow, if I don't snag a guest, we're going to uh, look at more, put a button on the shuttles of August, nine shuttles flown the month of August. Uh, STS-128 was launched on the 28th, 41D was launched today, August 30th, as was uh, STS-8, uh, and uh, we're glad that we have the UCF brothers' photos to share that with us today. So, uh, everybody, we're so grateful for everyone who came the last couple of days at the American Space Museum. Uh, it has made a difference not only in our bank account, but also in how everybody out there perceives this wonderful museum. Because we know once you come here, you're going to tell people that they, it's a must to come to here. You like our new carpet? Yes. It, 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 it looks, it, every time I come here, it keeps getting better and better. Well, good. Well, you're part of that, Bob, with <laughs> your help there. So until tomorrow... I'm Mark Marquette, and we hope to see you again to bridge the space between us.